Hi guys, welcome back to the Hugh Jeffries video and in this video I'm going to be repairing this old computer power supply that went bang when it was last in use. I had previously converted it into a bench power supply used for powering and testing small electronics when I was about 12 years old. Before that this power supply came from my first desktop computer, so it's pretty old. So to find out what happened and see if I can fix it, I'll need to open it up. Now I'd like to mention that I don't recommend this repair to anybody who doesn't have a decent knowledge of electronics and how components function. As this device plugs into mains power, it poses a risk of electric shock or injury. So be aware that you can proceed with this repair at your own risk. I also recommend leaving the device unplugged for a number of weeks or more to discharge the high voltage capacitors as they can store electricity for some time. As an extra measure, you can short out the two capacitor terminals at the bottom with an insulated screwdriver to remove any residual power, although I don't recommend doing this without first leaving it unplugged for at least a week. Now with that out of the way, I can remove the four screws and get inside the power supply unit. You can see looking at the capacitors on the low voltage side of things, one is bulging and the other one has completely blown its top off with a little hole in the top of it. This is what would have made the loud pop or bang sound from the power supply when it was last in use. Bad capacitors are a common issue with switching power supplies, so hopefully switching those out will fix our issue. The rest of the capacitors on the board seem okay, so it looks like I'll only need to change these two on the low voltage side of things. Now I'll need to undo some cable management that I put in place when I was using this as a bench power supply to give me enough room to remove the power supply from the housing. Now I won't be able to remove the board fully as the wires for the IEC connectors are soldered in place. However, there's plenty of room to be able to get in and desolder these capacitors. Now I did use a Sharpie just to put some small dots just so I could keep track of which solder joints I needed to remove to get the capacitors off. Now at first heating up the joint the solder didn't melt and I found that actually putting the solder first onto the soldering iron tip allowed it to transfer the heat across to the joint and therefore uh, add the solder. Now you might think it's a bit strange to be adding solder to something that you're trying to remove the component off but doing it this way will actually add fresh solder onto the joints which will make the removal process much easier and I can use some solder wick to heat up and transfer the solder from the joint onto the solder wick which will remove it from the board allowing me to remove the capacitor. Now the solder wick might not pick up all the solder so I may need to use the soldering iron just to heat up the joint once again to remove the capacitor. With the capacitor removed, we can see this one is 2200 microfarads at 10 volts. And the white stripe on the side indicates where the ground pin is on the capacitor, so you don't put it in backwards and blow it up, as these electrolytic capacitors only go in one direction. I can repeat the same process on the secondary capacitor, heating up the joint, adding a little bit of solder, and then removing the solder with the desoldering wick, which allows me to remove the capacitor. This one's also 2200 microfarads, but is rated at 16 volts, so we need to keep that in mind when using our replacement capacitors to make sure that these values match so we don't damage the capacitor when we install it and power on the device. You can see I've matched this with the replacement ones which are actually used and I salvaged these off of damaged electronics, so hopefully they will work in this power supply unit. However, you can slightly increase the voltage if need be, but you can't use a lower voltage cap as it can be seriously damaged if it is used with the incorrect voltage. I always recommend getting the exact replacement so you avoid any issues. But now it is time to reinstall these into the power supply and you can see these little black squares on the spots where the capacitor goes. Now that is where you need to be putting the ground pin of the capacitor which is indicated by a white stripe on the side. So double check that you put these in the right orientation before you solder them back into place. With mine sitting in place, I can apply solder on the back to secure them and allow them to conduct electricity. And once we've got the first one in, we can solder in the second capacitor and then that basically completes all of the repairs that this power supply should need. I've got some cleaning alcohol on a brush just to clean up any residue of flux left from the new solder joints. I also gave the rest of the board a bit of a clean as well just to get any dust off the device. I also gave the inside a little bit of a clean as well, 
this does actually sit out in the shed, so it's not a huge deal if it has a bit of dust or dirt in it. I'm not worried about the cosmetics of this device, I just need it to function. With everything back in place, I can screw in the four screws holding in the actual motherboard of the power supply unit and reroute all of the cables out the back of the unit, putting them in their little plastic clip before I can install the zip tie on the back, which will just hold in place the bundle of wires that I'm not using on the power supply itself. Now I can reinstall the top panel of the power supply unit before I test out the unit itself because this is not something you want to run without the top installed. With the full screws installed, it's time to plug in the little control box which I built um, to actually just plug and play with this unit and it spits out 3.3, 5 and 12 volts. Applying power, the power supply booted straight up and spat out 12 volts on the 12 volt line. Just to make sure everything is functioning, I'll unplug it from the 12 volt section, plug it into the 5 volt port and you can see 5 volts on the multimeter and I can do the same with 3.3 and you can see 3.3 volts there. The switch also works and the power supply unit will power off with a touch of the button and power back on, no worries. So this completes the repair but I'm just going to give the unit a bit of a clean, however the metal is quite pitted from being out in the shed, however like I said, cosmetics aren't really an issue with this as it's only being used outside in the shed. So this is it, with a couple of capacitors changed my bench power supply is back up in action. I salvaged these components from other old broken items so it didn't cost me anything to repair and I'm happy to have repaired this power supply rather than creating more landfill by throwing it out. Of course, don't attempt something like this without understanding the risks involved and do such repair like this at your own risk. And on that note, this has been a Hugh Jeffries video. If you like what you saw, hit that subscribe button and consider checking out the electronics repair playlist for more videos just like this one. Also, make sure to follow me on my social media, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.